Okay, I hope you can hear me over the fan. It's kind of warm. So now we're getting into this God Deeds mindset thing. And in later audio, I'm going to show how it is when it's working. But how it works is not how it plays. That's the hardest thing to understand about this. The entire goal that God has is to build Christ's thinking in us. That's 2 Corinthians 10.5. Okay? That's also echoed in a whole bunch of other verses like line on line, precept on precept, keep on having this thinking in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, Philippians 2, 5 and 10, Ephesians 3, 15 through 19, Ephesians 4, 13, which is the criterion for the rapture, that, that maturation in church corporate is achieved, which is every single person who's ever believed in Christ between Pentecost and rapture. Church and bride are the same. Every believer is part of church. Every believer is part of Christ. It's a harem. Now, not everybody in the harem gets to have authority or rulership. Just like everybody in a royal family doesn't end up having authority or rulership. You're born royal in Christ. That's First Peter 2, 5 and 9. Okay, we are a royal priesthood. Okay, but... Some priests clean toilets. You see the difference? So it is here. How much you learn to think like Christ down here, post, post salvation. So you couldn't even learn to think like Christ if you weren't already saved. You can't be filled with the Spirit if you're not already saved. Okay? So post-salvation, there is a growing that has to happen. And that growing is to grow in Christ, which we've all heard that phrase. What does that mean? That means growing in his thinking. It is not what you do with your body. Now that growth process is glitchy. First of all, because since it's God's deed, not yours, you can't tell that anything's happening to you. You do not know how mature you are today versus yesterday, the day before, six years ago. If you're still singing Ra Ra Jesus songs and you have an attention span of five seconds, like most Christians, then it's safe to say you're still a spiritual baby. If you're not using 1 John 1 9 like breathing, you're definitely a spiritual baby. If you still believe that your rituals or your works count with God, you are definitely a spiritual baby. If you're still wondering if it's okay to wear hats in church or not, or whether you should eat certain foods and abstain from others, you are definitely a spiritual baby. So there are benchmarks, but the amount of time isn't the benchmark. It's how mature you are in thinking. Okay, but if you don't know what the Bible says then you're not mature in thinking. The more you do know what Bible says, the more you have questions. The more there are issues in your life. Actually, quite frankly, the harder it gets to even stay a Christian. 99.9% .9 of everybody who's ever believed in Christ will stop believing in Christ by the time he dies. Or else they'll go in for the ritual and the magic or something like that. But more generally speaking, they just lose faith. That's typical. The attrition rate amongst Christians is about 99% by the time you die. It's a marathon race. Greek verb is trepho. And it's used in by Paul and in Hebrews 12 and other places. It's a marathon race. And most people are going to quit before they get to the finish line. Paul got to the finish line, 2 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. I don't know if I'll get to the finish line. I'm pretty far along. But I don't know. And I remember vaguely, you know, 30 years ago, I was a chirping Christian just like most of them are on YouTube. Oh, rah, rah, Jesus, and if you don't speak nice, then you're not a good Christian and all the other claptrap that baby Christians believe. Now, the problem is that the whole goal is not what you do, it's what you think. 
what you think will govern what you do, but what you do will always be unresponsive to what you think. That's the get the the glitch, okay? And Paul talks about that glitch in Romans seven. Here he is, probably the most advanced believer in the church age, or, you know, if not the most advanced, close to it. And look at what he says. And you can read that even in translation. It's not that bad. Here I see one thing in the Bible and I believe in it and I know it. And then I see I'm doing something else. In other words, what we call back backsliding. Paul is saying it's the norm. You can't backslide if you don't know something's wrong. See, so that he's saying the minute I get exposed to the truth and I believe it and I agree it's right and true and good. That's when I start dis- I, I see myself disobeying it. Yeah, because, as he says in Romans 8, because he's leading up to Romans 8, the carnal person can't obey. The sin nature cannot obey God. Can't know God, can't obey God, nothing. Okay, well, the sin nature's in your corpuscles. So here you are, knowing something that's true and good and right in Scripture. That's in your soul. You believe in it. And then you see, like Paul says, another law working in my life. The law of sin. Yeah. And that's what makes a mature person want to quit. So you got one reason for quitting when you're a spiritual baby. You don't know anything and you can't see God. Of course you can't see God. You don't have to know, you have to know scripture to see God. So you have to live on your emotions and that pans out pretty quick and that's why I don't hear from God and and I you know I need healing and miracles and how come God doesn't talk to me and all the things that they get into so you got one reason for quitting when you're a kid okay but if you get past being a kid only about 10% of Christians so you're looking at like half a percentage of the whole human population only about 10% of Christians even get past spiritual childhood. And that's when the fun really begins. Because all of a sudden, all that stuff you heard the atheists say, you suddenly understand where they're coming from. All that stuff you heard all these people in other religions say, you suddenly understand where they're coming from. And you know what's wrong with their answers? But you found a whole lot of other things in the Bible that are disturbing. And how do you come to grips with that? And frankly, most people, they struggle with it for maybe 5, 10, even 15 years. And at some point, they either give up and they go back into religion, or they just give up entirely and stop being Christians in their mind. They're still saved, but they just give up. And you can understand that. This is a weird book. Christianity is a weird belief. It starts with a weird gospel. Believe in this guy you've never met, that a God exists that you can't see. And by the way, you have to believe this guy did this thing 2,000 years ago you know nothing about. And if you don't believe, you're going to burn forever. That's about as weird a message as it gets. And of course, you know, 90% of the human population, 99% of the human population, doesn't believe that message. So it looks like God's kind of, you know, nasty and unfair. So you've got a choice of God being nasty or unfair, or saying that the message that you're being told is not true. Well, you're going to pick the latter and call yourself a Christian and pretend that there's no such thing as hell or that that you know soul life is conditional that only the people who believe in Christ live forever or whatever else that'll make you feel comfortable calling yourself a Christian and and yet resolve this thing that you can't stand understandably so that you know hi most of the world therefore is going to hell that's a hard thing to live with yeah well it gets harder That's just the beginning of the troubles. You know, one of the words for being a Christian in the Bible is is thlipsis. That was used as a password to prove that you were Greek or not. And obviously I'm not Greek because I can't say it right. Thlipsis is translated tribulation and properly so. 
But just like anything else, you can say pain with, you know, a small P and pain with a capital P. There's tribulation that's capital T, and then there's tribulation that's just the normal hassle. But it's the same quality. You got a lot of issues here. You got this weird gospel. You got this thing about hell to deal with. Okay, and then bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. Hello? 2 Corinthians 10.5, at some point in your life, after childhood, if you get that far, that verse is going to hit you smack dab in the head. And you're going to realize, hey, wait a minute. All these pulpits and all these people claiming that being a good Christian was behavior and doing good deeds, they're all wrong. It's what goes on the inside, like Paul's talking about in Romans 7, and everywhere else he talks. It's not what you do on the outside. It's the battle on the inside. Any Muslim can give the charity that doesn't make him a good Christian. Any unbeliever can give the charity and do good deeds and be moral. That doesn't make him a good Christian. Being a Christian does not mean what you do with your body or how moral you are or how good your deeds are. Anybody can do those and billions of people do every day. There are billions and billions and billions of good deeds being done every single day. And it's not going to get anybody nearer to heaven and it's not going to make any Christian grow spiritually. If the unbeliever can do it, then it doesn't help you grow in Christ. Period. It didn't save you, and it won't help you grow. Okay, but what does help you grow? Hi, learn and live on this book that every time you turn around tells you something that's really hard to accept. And it starts with a stark gospel that's really hard to live with. You wake up in the morning. You go to work. On your way to work, how many people do you see? 99% of them are going to hell. Now you're at work. How many people do you work around? 99% of them are going to hell. You get on the internet. You're in a chat room. You're on YouTube. 99% of the commenters, 99% of the people making those videos, they're going to hell. How do you live with that? And of course, we can't live with it. It drives us nuts. So we make all these videos trying to convert everybody. Because it hurts to know this. And then people will accuse us of trying to sell the gospel. Because as if we needed their opinion to agree with ours in order to feel good about God. No. It's because we're panicked. It's like you're one person and 99 people around you all have this you know, fatal disease, and you don't, you're immune. And like I said, that's only the start of the troubles. That's only the beginning of the flipses. Now you got this other thing, bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. Hello, how are you going to do that? That's the standard. And Paul treats it like, hi, this is happening right now. Yeah, well, it's Paul. He's writing in like 50 A.D. when he writes that letter. Okay. He'd been a Jew all of his life. He'd been training under Gamaliel since he was 14. In 30 A.D. he gets hit on the Damascus Road. And he's writing about 20 years later. Yeah, that's 20 years of Bible under his belt. And he already knew it well before he got hit. Okay, so that means that you're not bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. You don't know the Bible as well as Paul did. And how are you going to make every thought bring into captivity? I'm sorry. I have to eat. I have to pee. I have to look up the schedule for the bus. I have to fill out a grocery list. I got thoughts I'm spending on those things. It's not going into captivity to Christ. How is this going to happen? Well, you know how it happens? God has to do it to you. There has to be a way where you can be bifurcated in your thinking. 
where you are constantly online and constantly aware of God and yet at the same time constantly doing something else. It's like listening to music and writing an email at the same time to try and make a prosaic example. And you do get trained in doing that. In fact, a lot of people are, are really, you know, hung up on that. They'll have their music on, their television on, and they'll be playing on a tablet all at one time. Yeah, well, that's how you have to live the spiritual life, too. You have to constantly be monitoring your thoughts for whether you're sinning. You have to constantly be monitoring your thoughts for whether God agrees with what you're thinking. Thinking. And then somehow all that's got to coordinate with you, with your body. And your body is like, you know, Windows 8. You don't know how it works. It's always lagging behind. You're always doing the wrong thing with it. It's always kind of not responding the way you need it to respond. It wants to do something other than what you want to do. And all too often it, it, it's too, it feels too good to give into it. So you're not bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. That's the way Christ had to live. He had online, every thought of his was online and in line with Father. Even when he was asleep. Well, that's impossible. So sooner or later, you start thinking, oh, you know, am I hallucinating this spiritual life? Yeah, this is in Bible. I can prove it. Second Corinthians 10, 5. It's right there in front of my face. And once you know the Greek and Hebrew, you know it's even well translated. Oh. Because that's, that's an echo of the first commandment. Say, first commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and strength. And it meant mind strength and body strength and goods. It's all combined. The word strength in English. Christ changed it to noia, dianoia, your thinking. He upgraded the first commandment in the New Testament and the Gospels. It's with all your heart and soul and thinking. He uses the word dianoia, which means every thought coming out of your heart. So, that, you know, coming in your mind. So that's what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 10.5, is the first commandment that Christ upgraded. Okay, but you'd have to be Jesus Christ to do that. Yes, that's the point. You have to learn how to think like Christ. And today you don't. And you never will if you're busy working on the good deeds thing. Okay, but when you are, it's very strenuous on the brain. It's very tiresome. When you are practicing this, and you'll do it and forget, and do it and forget, use 1 John 1 9, get back online, then forget, use 1 John 1 9 again, get back online. It's a really bad internet connection because your soul's always, you know, being, what do you want to call it, deflected with all the stuff around you and the stuff you have to do with this body. Okay, that's very tiring, and then you're going to sit there one day and say, you know what? This is too hard. I can't do this. It's not working. Am I really sure that this Bible is really from God? Because it's so wearing. Now, of course, it depends on when you get that question in your head. How well you know Bible at that point. And whether or not you really want to keep fighting. Because the answers are in the Bible. They prove why this is the accurate interpretation. They prove why you, you sh should at that point have a great deal of proof that God is real and yes, he's the God of the Bible. You're going to need that proof in order to go on. You need constant bidirectional feedback from God just to get through a 24-hour period. That's what that verse means. Every thought being brought into captivity of Christ, if you're not bidirectional with God, you don't know how to do that. Because you can't do it on your own. Basically, you're constantly looking at God and thinking, okay, is what I'm thinking right? What should I be thinking, Dad? I must say that to him 10,000 times a day. What should be in my head, Dad? Because he's got a will for every single moment I breathe. And I'm constantly in the wrong place. I'm exhausted by the end of the day. Now, assuming you decide, and you're going to have to keep deciding, 
that you want to keep fighting the fight and learning how this bringing into thought into captivity falling down using 1 John 1 9 seeing that your life is just like Paul describes in Romans 7 falling down again using 1 John 1 9 again Gad am I what should I be thinking now all I do this email go to the bathroom you know sit in a boardroom try to tell the chairman of the board that he needs to take a $100,000 deduction or whatever it is you do if you want to keep fighting then you get to the next level where it gets even harder And I'll cover that in the next increment.